Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Hello. It's Friday. That's right. That's what we want to hear from librarians. More hooting. Um, <laughs> so I'm really excited today to um, present to you Christine Shermer, who is fabulous. Um, she works just down the way um, at Pinterest headquarters here in San Francisco. And um, in addition, Christine comes with an entourage. Her mom and dad are here, both retired librarians. I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And in advance, I also have to say, happy Mother's Day. If you're a mom and if you're not, call your mother. Um, so without further ado, here's Christine and get ready to, to learn to love to pin. <laughs> Thanks so much, guys. Good morning. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, as Rachel mentioned, I'm Christine Shermer. I lead consumer communications for Pinterest. Um, and today's unique for me in a couple of different ways. Uh, first, um, I'm usually the speech writer, so I'm usually sitting in the audience and not standing on stage. So thank you in advance for your patience with me as a speaker. And secondly, as Rachel mentioned, um, today was particularly meaningful to me because I am the child of two librarians. Um, as she mentioned, my mother was a school librarian for more than 30 years. My father, a direct public director, a director of a public library um, on Long Island. And I think what makes Pinterest unique and my initial fascination with it is that our charter is very similar to libraries. At the end of the day, we're both in the business of wanting to help people discover and save ideas. So a um, couple of goals today before I get going. Um, I know this group is usually among the first to adopt technology, and many of you are already using Pinterest. I've seen the great examples. But I also know that you serve communities that might be unfamiliar with Pinterest, or more likely, as we find here in the United States, unconvinced that Pinterest is relevant to their life. They don't think they need another social network. Um, so I guess my hope today is to give you a deeper understanding of what we're working on, and maybe to win over some advocates um, to help folks use our tool. So um, if our founders were here, they would tell you when they got going, their mission was to help people discover things that they love and then inspire them to go do them in real life. So here's how we try to make that happen. OK, so this is your path to discovery on the internet. This particular example, I decide I want a red Honda CRV. We have a world-class solution for that on the internet. It's called Google. They're down in Mountain View. But what happens if you're just looking for Hondas? Or you're just interested in cars? Or maybe you can't think of the name of what you're looking for, and, and you just want to browse. This is the problem that we're trying to help. So that's probably the first misconception that I'd love to clear up today. Uh, despite what you might have heard, um, we do not define ourselves as a social network. Hopefully that's welcome news for anybody that doesn't need another messaging app on their phone. We really think that we're working on the problem of search. We actually hear from pinners um, that Pinterest is a very personal experience. They don't go on there to connect with other people. They go on there to fall down that black hole of discovering about their interests. So you can do three things on Pinterest currently. The first is save. And you can save in a couple of different ways. Currently, you can either pin from the board of another user. Oh, sorry, go back to Discover. You can either pin from the board of another user or another media outlet, like for instance, the New York Times, and we have a bookmarklet. That's a little tab that's on the Chrome browser, and it's literally like bookmarking your page in a book. You just hit that button and it can go right to a page. It's um, perhaps pretty fitting that we started as a place to save. Um, if you've heard anything about our founder, uh, Ben Silberman, he actually um, spent most of his childhood, as we understand, locked in his room in Iowa, collecting and archiving the bugs that he had. So Pinterest really started as a place for online collections. But what happened after people amassed millions of pins was that we discovered that we we needed a better way to help people find those pins. Um, and so Pinterest search was born. 
And today, you can discover things in five different ways. So you can type right into that search tab on the home page. You can follow, and then the boards and the pins that you follow will be in a home feed, and you'll see those displayed. There's something now called related pins. Many people think these are promoted pins or advertisements. That's not actually the case. These are actually based on an algorithm of what you've pinned previously. And they're shown to you in an effort to introduce you to new content. We have a category search. You can search everything from art to technology. And you can send a pin. So for instance, how I use this is, I find a recipe during the day that I think sounds good for dinner, I send it to my husband and I hope he makes it in time for dinner. <laughs> and then we come to do, and this is really the latest problem that we're working on. Um, we have something called rich pins, and I don't know how many of you are familiar, but we have six different kinds of rich pins. And what they do is when you make, when you pin something, which is a bookmark from the web, it actually pulls in a little bit of extra information on the back end, metadata. And it can work in a couple of different ways. So for instance, if you have a recipe rich pin, it will automatically tell you what ingredients do you need and how much time is it going to take to prepare. If it's a place pin, it'll drop it on a map so you have a phone number and an address for easy navigation on your phone. If it's a product pin, my personal favorite, you'll know where to find it. If there's a price drop, if it's in stock someplace. There are movie pins, um, which will give you show times, ticket information, cast information. Um, if you, our most recent um, Rich Pin, that's pretty exciting, was a partnership with Apple. So for anyone who's tried to discover um, apps on iOS, sometimes that can be challenging. So now with an app Rich Pin, you can easily find apps based on your interests and then install them directly to iOS. So that's a lot of words. I thought it might be interesting to look at this um, in the journey of a pinner. So this is Kelly Pollock in the middle there. I actually met her a couple months ago. And she sent us a letter to talk to us about how she used Pinterest. And I know that sounds kind of crazy, but we get them a lot. So we have a big bulletin, ball, uh, bulletin board of, of Pinner Mail where we start to understand more about how pinners are using the service. So Kelly was a young mom of two in North Carolina. And one day, you know, she went for her annual checkup and she found out that she um, had diabetes. And the doctor said to her, you know, I think you really need to consider a lifestyle change. And she came home and said, a lifestyle change? What's that? How do I define that? What's that going to be for me? I'm, you know, I'm not an athlete. I've never had an exercise routine in my life. Um, so she just went on Pinterest and she browsed. And the first thing she found was a quote. If you like quotes, Pinterest is a great place to go. For me, I always find something original to write in a birthday card from there. Pro tip on that. <laughs> Um, but she found this quote that said, run, no one ever drowned in sweat. And she said it sat there on her board for a couple of weeks. She didn't really do anything about it, but she thought about that. And she thought, no one ever drowned in sweat. I can try. And then a couple of weeks later, she found this pin from Nike, actually. And it was a suggestion of the best running shoes for first-time runners. So she made a purchase. She bought some sneakers. And she tells us that I wasn't ready to run yet. I went walking every day in those sneakers, but I started to feel comfortable in them. So then I went on, and lo and behold, I found a pin about local running groups in my town, local trails, the time it would take, which ones to do first. Now I had a routine. And then I'm really pleased to report one of the reasons why we invited Kelly um, to our headquarters a couple months ago was that she actually completed her first marathon which you saw in the first slide. And um, she now runs a running group for young moms in North Carolina. So that's her story of how she became a pinner. So just to give you some stats and some size, we've actually updated this um, since this slide was designed. So um, there are about 70 million people worldwide, primarily here in the US, but now we're um, rapidly growing, about 30% of our users outside the United States. And we've act, they've actually now amassed 50 billion, excuse me, 50 billion pins, 500 billion pins on 1 billion boards, which is kind of staggering if you think about it. 
Um, as our head of partnerships, Joanne Bradford likes to say, that's like 500 billion pages of a magazine that somebody ripped out. 500 billion pages of a magazine that you can access from your phone. And mobile, by the way, is clearly the path um, forward for Pinterest. About 80% of daily visits are from a mobile phone. So that's what you do when you're pinning. But I, as I understand, many of you that are here today are also in charge of curating and creating content for organizations on Pinterest. So what I'd like to spend a little bit of time on is to share some of the tips that we share with big brands and, and organizations on how they can be the most successful. So here's what a pin looks like. To me, it looks a little bit like a magazine cover. It's a blank canvas. You have a nice clean image. You have a title. And then down below, you have something called the pin description. The pin description is both the most overlooked, but also the most important part of the pin that you want to think about. The data that you put in that pin description is both the introduction that you offer to the pinner, but it also helps index the information around search. So you want to put as much in there that makes the pin helpful and tells the pinner what's the information that's behind that. I'm telling you. So here are two examples. Okay, on the right, we have sunset at Poipu Beach in Kauai, which I was lucky enough to see with my parents, and I hope you all get to see someday. Beautiful. I can look at that. But it's important to remember that people come to Pinterest not to look. They come to learn. So what can you tell them about Poipu Beach? Perhaps you want to tell them that it's on the south shore of Kauai, that they can see uh, monk seals, that they can go snorkeling with sea turtles. My husband says never touch a sea turtle. I don't know, people in Hawaii tell you that. Um, but you want to put as much there that might be interesting to a pinner. More helpful. And you'll hear me say that a couple of times. Pins should be helpful. But there's something that we see in common among all successful pins. It's the hacks. It's the how-tos. It's the lists. It's things that people would want to rip out of a magazine or put up on a pin board to remember to do for later. A couple of other rules of thumb to keep in mind. Detailed descriptions, we talked about that. Step-by-step -step instructions, how-tos, lists. This is the secret of folks like BuzzFeed and the New York Times that are doing extremely well both on Pinterest and on the web right now is how many times have we seen that? You know, top 10 sunsets on beaches, top 10 ways to lose weight, top 10 resources you'll want in your community. So lists are something that um, do extraordinarily well. Tasteful branding, is there any other kind? And you'll want to keep um, the colors pretty subtle. We hear that blue, much like being on camera, we hear that blue is a good color, but in general, you just want to tone down any kind of branded colors and, and settings. You really want the information to be foremost. Text overlays. So here are some examples of some really um, high-performing pins. And when I say high-performing, I mean hundreds of thousands of repins in the last week alone. The perfect messy bun. No limitations, then defy them from Nike. Holiday safety tips from Pampers. And you'll see that Pampers is sort of secondary to the information that they're providing there. And how to make a snowball cake. Um, I want to take a moment and pause on promoted pins and explain the difference between promoted pins and organic pins. So about six months ago, we made promoted pins available um, to many of the brands that we work with. Um, and those are now available um, in category search, they're available in your home feed, and they're labeled as a promoted pin. The way they work is they also follow our algorithm so that you see pins that are based on things that you've previously been pinning. So we might get it wrong sometimes, but what we're really hoping to surface is, for instance, if you know about me that I like to pin modern furniture and that I'm looking for a couch right now, I might see a pin from West Elm on a gray couch that they have on sale. Those are promoted pins. These are organic pins. I wanted to show you folks that are just putting pins out in the ecosystem who was most successful in 2014. We have Nabisco on the left, 
with the sprinkle Oreo pops. Um, the theory on that is obviously it's a very colorful image. It's a fun hack on a product, how to take a product and then make it something different. We hear that from a lot of brands that we work with. Um, one of my favorite stories is about Downy Unstoppables. Does anybody know what that is? I didn't either, it's okay. Um, it is, I believe, something that you put in your dryer um, to make your laundry smell great. But it turns out, um, when Downey went on to Pinterest, what people were doing was they loved that scent so much that they were hacking into it and using it for other kinds of products. So there were pins on how to make a candle from that or how to make a sachet from that. And what Downey actually did was to start and make those products. So now they make products that Pinners gave them the ideas for. Um, ideas for long hair. Sorry to leave you out, gentlemen. And maybe it's important to mention that as well. I think we hear a lot about how um, Pinterest is a product for women. Um, someone said to me last week, you know, women are from Pinterest and men are from Reddit. <laughs> um, but I, I like to let people know that men in the US are the fastest growing demographic. Um, and really, when we see the Pinterest introduced for the first time to a market overseas, that gender difference split is really 50-50. So our hypothesis is, you know, when things grow by word of mouth, as Pinterest did, uh, that communities, women tend to refer things to other women, tend to have similar interests to other women. Um, but really, we're both excited and um, very um, positive about the future of both genders and, and being a place where people can discover interests of all kinds. Uh, next up, I wanted to include this one to show you that um, a very small blogger can be quite successful on Pinterest. In fact, many have grown their business on Pinterest, and this was about the ultimate road trip. We have um, a guide to Disney World at Christmas Again, thinking about the kind of information that uh, a pinner might not be able to find elsewhere, organizing it for them in a list. And then easy restaurant style blender salsa. So how do you make something that's restaurant professional in a couple of easy steps? So that's great, because those are Fortune 500 brands with lots of budgets. But today's conversation is about nonprofits and community organizations and how they can use Pinterest. So I will be the first to tell you that I think this is maybe the third or fourth session that we've done with a community organization or a nonprofit, something that I hope we do a lot more of. But um, there's less information based on best practices. So I think that, that means two things for you guys. One, I think um, there's a lot of what we call green screen to uh, really become quite successful on Pinterest quickly um, and to really define what some of those best practices are. So I wanted to give you a few of my favorite examples. The American Red Cross, incidentally, they had a top performing pin last week, again organic, um, around earthquake relief in Nepal. Um, but what I love is if you look at their Pinterest board, it's a little bit like a museum exhibit. Um, so while they might use something like Facebook or Twitter to get the word out about a relief effort, they use Pinterest to inspire both donors and volunteers. So these are all links to articles about their past, iconic images, um, and really hoping to let people know, um, I believe, the several hundred year commitment they've had. Operation Smile, anybody familiar with them? I, I wasn't, but it's an organization uh, dedicated to surgical repair of cleft lip and cleft palate. And I think they're pretty clever on what they do on Pinterest because celebrities is content that does really well. Surprise, surprise. It's content that does really well in magazines as well. Um, so a lot of people are browsing celebrity content. And what Operation Smile has done is they've used Pinterest as a way to aggregate all the coverage of their celebrity ambassadors around the world. And they include a really compelling image of that celebrity. So if someone's searching for Jennifer Lawrence, let's say, that will come up. And then they let you know what are the projects that Jennifer Lawrence is working on in relation to Operation Smile. They take you to the event where you can find more information about their organization. So a news aggregator. Um, and this is a slide that I actually borrowed um, from an organic meetup that I went to last year of several thousand teachers. Um, teachers are one of the largest communities on Pinterest. Um, 
What I learned from them last year is they really started using the service um, as a collaboration tool. Lesson plans, um, classroom displays, recommended reading lists. They might have a secret board. Yes, you can have a secret board for anybody that didn't know that. So you can always not share what you're saving or collaborating on. Um, but interestingly, as, as I talked to them, they said, you know, as they spent more time on Pinterest, it was also becoming some place where they could get mentorship and ideas from around the country. So we see a lot of connections forming between teachers based on similarities of students, interests, um, and they're not necessarily connecting as individuals. They're not sharing personal information about themselves the way, way they would on a social network, but they're exchanging ideas. which brings us to everyone's favorite topic, libraries. Um, the New York Public Library is the largest library on Pinterest, um, both in follower count as well as amount of content. Um, and, that, and that brings me to maybe um, the third um, reminder I want to give you today, which is how do you measure your success on Pinterest? Um, and one of the things that I would keep in mind is that any account can be converted to a business account just by going to business.pinterest.com. Definitely write that down, minefield of information there, business.pinterest.com. Um, and what that will give you is a dashboard um, of three different metrics. And these are the metrics that we think are most important for you to pay attention to. Repins, click-throughs, and impressions. And the reason why all three are important is repins is the most common metric I take from you, I share to my network. Um, click-throughs, because you see um, who's not just uh, looking at the pin, but also clicking through for more information. And impressions, how large is that audience? So when you see that follower count over here in the right-hand side, and we hear that a lot from um, media partners, celebrity partners, people who want that really big number so that they can say, I have so many followers. Not that important on Pinterest. Let me explain that. So the followers represent the number of people who are seeing your content because they're following you. That is only a percentage of your audience. As we spoke about in the beginning, people can discover your content based on search, based on categories, and so that follower count number is actually gonna be much smaller than your potential audience size. Um, but back to how the New York Public Library is using it. Uh, you know, they primarily use it as a literary tool. They have some cool stuff on, on past art exhibits that they've had. Um, but I see the most engagement with recommended summer reading lists. They use it for book reviews of new things in the collection. Just an easy place where people can see if they don't have an opportunity to talk to a librarian, what are the things that you would like them to know. And last but not least, We get to the Berkeley Public Library, who, for those of you who don't know Rachel in the front row, is the administrator of this board, which I think is brilliant for several reasons. Not only is it used as a resource um, around books and periodicals, but it's really a community resource for Berkeley as a whole, which is really what I hope the library is all about. So there's information um, on... Um, well, I'm going to have you come up in a little bit and speak to specifics, but there's information on their programming, there's information on their collections, and then my very favorite is about bikes, the ultimate Berkeley accessory. Um, so how to find your perfect bike for your size, Bay Area bike trails, um, and something that I really think is both evergreen content, you know, something that people can enjoy for many years, but also a really great look at the inspiration behind the community. So, on that note, I would love to invite Rachel up to talk a little bit about what, how the library is using Pinterest, and maybe we can have sort of a two-way conversation about ideas. This is great. Okay. okay, so here I am again. Um, this is one of the pages that we, that we use on our website. Um, like most people and most libraries, you have um, a web, web administrator, and it can be really difficult to come up with original content for your website without going through a long process. Um, 
it, you may need to know HTML, you may not. We use Drupal on our website, but even so, it, it required us to do something like this, we'd have to do a lot of original content. We'd have to go out, get a photographer to find a picture. Then we'd have to research it ourselves and write it up. But the world has already done this for us. And so we, instead of um, doing all that original work ourselves, you know, as librarians, we're really curators of information. We don't have to be the creators as well. So we found, um, we have a page on our website called Popular Topics, and there are things that are really near and dear to us in Berkeley. So uh, we just got a new library on wheels that goes out in our community, and this was one way that we promoted it with um, all sorts of biking information. We had um, Twitter and Instagram bike rides where you could meet up with the library on wheels and, and go around the city and read excerpts of banned books along the way. Um, so lots of fun events that the... Um, in order to create a, like a really dynamic web page about that, it would take us forever. But here, we're just able to connect immediately to people's content. We're not taking their content and using it. We don't have to do a bibliography. It's already there. Because um, we're not actually owning that information. We're just putting people in connection to things that we think will be valuable to them. So this is one. Um, typically, these popular topics board uh, correspond to our banner images across our website. So um, this winter we had um, a banner image that was books with snow, and we had one for adults and one for kids, um, winter-themed books. And if you clicked on the banner image, it would take you to a popular topics page with a bibliography of books for um, adults and teens and kids. Um, we're trying to get our Alexander Street Press to get a secure server so we can have a playlist streaming right there. Now you have to log in. And these are all widgets that are available through your help page. You basically just copy the HTML associated to the playlist that you've created and make your playlist public and pop it in. But Pinterest also has a great widget creator. So once you have your board, you can go in, create the widget, copy the HTML, and just drop it into any page. And then up comes this board. Um, the only issue that we have, and we haven't heard any complaints, is that you have to have a Pinterest membership to access it. Um, but shockingly, no one has complained. So we're assuming that everybody in the world is pinning, um, <laughs> like we are on our breaks, never during work time. Um, <laughs> except when you're paid to do it, OK? So. Um, we had the winter, we had a nice historic photo of um, a Berkeley blizzard in 1921, a picture of Cragmont Rock covered in snow with little tiny cottages covered in snow. And then there's the Pinterest page, which tells you where you could possibly see snow anywhere close to us. <laughs> um, there's a, there's a, a YouTube video we found of a place like a, uh, an hour and a half away that has a, um, a snow slide with a ramp that kind of brings kids, I know. Um, and you can just go there, take the ramp up, it's an automated ramp, and then the kids inner tube down. I mean, for East Coasters, we want some snow, and we're gonna show people where to find some, some winter entertainment. Um, and so we wanna make people aware of what's happening in your community, but we also don't wanna make um, kind of, a, you know, like a, a bookmark, say, or a flyer even if it's in the nicest shade of green. It's really, we want people to be able to pull it up on their phone and have it right there. And for us, this is a great way for us to um, connect people in ways that we can't necessarily do if someone just calls or someone stops by. This is a great visual tool to just give to somebody and say, um, fool around in here, you can't believe what you'll find. Um, so we have winter, um, we have we have a quilt show right now, so we're working on, a, on a, a board of quilting. We have an ongoing maker space at our North Branch Library, and we always had Pinterest up and ready. We had the sewing machines out, linoleum block cutting materials, you know, all kinds of craftiness. And when people would come in and say, I don't know how to um, hem these pants, I said, don't worry, the internet's no. <laughs> I will not. <laughs> they wish, but um, they, uh, I could barely do my own, but they, um, they do, ha there's great tutorials. It's like the great 10 steps to the perfect jeans, like how to do a, how to do a blind hem on jeans, which is incredible. And it's hard to wrap your mind around it when you just want to wear those jeans out that weekend. But um, 
we've put people in touch with lots of resources that we might not have a book on. There's no book on how to hem jeans, I'm sorry. If you find it, please, some of the ISBN. But um, we really found that that was a great way to get people talking. So even we'd have the projector up and the Pinterest up and we had a wireless um, keyboard and we would pass it around and people would um, look up their project and say, you know, I'm working on this, I want to try this. And the whole um, group that would come to our makerspace would start looking at that pin board when they were away from the library because we only had that event once a month and refer back and say, okay, now this is what she was talking about. And this other guy brought in, he was going to make a hammock or a poncho for Burning Man. Crazy stuff that, you know, we would never think to put up ourselves, but we would just pass it around the room and people would, would pin what they didn't want to lose. And I think that was a great way to let people know um, that it's accessible. As far as internally, we have a few people that can add pins to the boards. So we invite pinners. Um, can I have a group board? Mm -hmm. Any collaborators? Actually, no, sorry. Okay. Mic. Do you make it. I always wanted to have a side game. Well, it's, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's all you. <laughs> um, yeah, you can. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's on. Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, that's subtle. Um, you, you can have a group board. I didn't mention that. So you can have several people collaborate, and that's for both the secret board. You're working on a project together, and you kind of want to both pin there, or on an ongoing basis. So you can have several people managing an account, managing a profile. Um, many times, this is a nice way to introduce one audience to another. So you invite somebody on as a guest pinner, maybe an expert in your community on a certain topic. And if they know Pinterest really well, their um, followers and people interested in their content will then see your content. So it's a nice way to, to cross-pollinate as well. Uh, we're actually doing this right now with, uh, we're doing a teen room renovation. Uh, our first floor is gonna be turned into a, like teen mania. And we have a shared board between uh, myself, the teen librarians, uh, the architects, and the teens who are like a teen advisory board. So once they have their account, they follow the board and then you can invite them to, excuse me, <clears throat> you can invite them to pin. And it's a way of, you know, putting up ideas and putting ideas out there for other people to look at that's really, um, I think, a little bit safer for some people because they don't feel like, well, this is my idea and I'm really tied to it. They can put something out there and say, I saw this, what do you think? Um, we do a lot of meetings uh, where I'll show a pin board and say, these are some of the options because I find sometimes if you, if you say, this is what we're going to do, people are like, mm, no. But if you give people a lot of visual options to say, this I like, this not so much, can we do more of that, I like this font, and you kind of pull you know, for brainstorming ideas what the elements are that really work for you. Um, so that's how we use it internally. Cool. Yeah. Um, one other maybe side note. Um, uh, that I'd like to mention as well is with that embed tool and also on Pinterest, we get a lot of questions about copyright, both from publications that want to pick up the coverage, but also from people that want to know how it works. Um, and one of the things I really enjoy about Pinterest um, is that the whole purpose of it is to be a bookmark to lead it back to the original link and lead it back to the original creator. So. Um, while we are not perfect 100% of the time and we work very actively to remove copyright infringement, it's really the best way to credit an idea on the internet is to either pin it from the source or to embed it into some place because you will send the traffic back to that individual and most people are pinning because they want to get the traffic and the eyeballs from throughout the web. Um, oh, you know what one other yeah, thing we, was? Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> We're going on the road later. Um, one other thing that we do, I don't know if how many of you um, curate book lists online. Do you all make book lists that you put on your website? Um, this is great because in your OPAC or if you use Millennium, whatever, there's, a, there's an image of your book. You can pin the image of your book and create a Pinterest page of all your titles. They're going to go right back to your collection. Um, which can be a lot easier. I mean, we're using Drupal, and you have to go in and find the B record and the long, you know, web address, and then save it into another file, then pull it back. In. It's like, you know, it's a little tedious. But this way, it's like, oh, look at the pretty picture. That's the one I want. And you just, it's so much easier than to go in and edit things. You could just delete the pin, and it's gone if, if somehow someone's dog ate the book or whatever. Um, but it's a really quick way to make book lists, um, 
and to promote your own collection and bring people back to you. Because a lot of our pins do send people elsewhere. Um, but we're talking about starting to, to make book lists, not just of good books out there in the world, but really that are from our own website. So as part of my job, um, I usually tell speakers that you should never ask your audience to remember more than three things. So I'm going to give you <laughs> just three things to take away today, and then hopefully you'll hop over to business.pinterest.com um, to find more information. The first is we'd like you to think of Pinterest as visual search. It is a visual bookmarking tool to discover and save creative ideas on the internet. Two, pins are very evergreen. So unlike social network where something pops up, most of the highest performing pins on Pinterest are things that are there for a very long time. So put evergreen content there. And lastly, um, I think I'll leave you with opportunity, which is, as I mentioned before, there are not um, many public organizations yet taking advantage of it, but there are really big organizations taking advantage and making a lot of money off of it. So I hope what I can impart to you today is, is to check it out, um, to use it as ways to share your information, and hopefully we'll grow your audiences um, and your goals as rapidly as the larger folks. Thanks so much for inviting me, and I'd love to open it up for questions. <laughs> Oh, so Mark is gonna is gonna do the questions. Oh, yeah. Nice. Thank you. I don't know. Would it be helpful if I pulled up the the Pinterest web page so you can see how to make the widgets, that sort of thing? Okay. I'd love to know too, just as, as quick. Oh, yeah. Should I? No, you got it. Um, a quick show of hands. Who is actively pinning right now, either personally or not right this moment? But I am. <laughs> what about right at this moment? <laughs> Um, and who thought it, who would have defined it as a social network? All right, that, that, so I have an educated audience. I should not be surprised. Um, yeah, I think those are sort of the, the two questions, but maybe if I could turn it over to you or if there are things that were either confusing about my presentation today or things I didn't address. Thanks. Um, my name's Gina Kessler-Lee, I'm from St. Mary's College Library, and we have 1,500 followers on our Pinterest page, and uh, though I guess repins or, or other metrics might be more um, relevant They're for uh, measuring engagement, but um, we were very active on posting to Pinterest, and now we are considering not because of the um, requirement now that our users sign in and create a Pinterest account in order to view our content. Because we were creating a lot of book lists, sharing it with faculty, and, and we had like co-managed pages with departments so they could also um, highlight stuff going on in their department and we could highlight relevant books. Um, but we're really wary of making our users sign up for something. Um, and you know, especially with you know, privacy concerns and, and things like that. So um, yeah, I wondered if you could address that new requirement that blocks half the screen and says, in order to see the pins, you have to sign up. Thank yeah. Um, thank you for that feedback, and I will definitely share that, and you're not the first to share that. Um, I believe our current new user experience allows you to see one pin and then puts that screen up. Um, my pitch to you today is, unlike other services on the web, um, please don't feel that they need to sign up with Facebook. Um, please know that um, we take very little user information. We know very little about our users other than, I believe we ask a question about gender and interests to be able to serve you some relevant information. We don't have personal identifiable information like addresses um, or other things on social networks. Um, and part of the reason why we do that is, um, does anyone get email from Pinterest? Do they pay attention to that? Yeah, so um, we send out um, actually 10 different emails a week um, based algorithmically on what you pin. So we really see that email and that account information as an extension of the product. So what we're hoping to do is to send you other relevant information and help you discover more interests. And because that has been such a valuable experience and we've seen people go from um, occasional users to monthly users to daily users using that, that's the reason um, for, the, for the email sign up. But I hear you, and it's definitely something we debate. Do 
just as a continuation of that, especially with a younger audience, like I didn't even realize that I've been putting up recommendations from my middle schoolers. It's great. They can go look at it. They can't go look at it anymore without setting up an account. Because they're not 13, you mean? Well, because they're not 13 and because they have to set up an account. They were just viewing the content. Yeah, so I, yeah, I believe the new user experience, if they're not a registered Pinterest user, is they can see one pin or one board to get a sense of what the product is. And then after that, we will ask for that email information. Um, we are definitely growing what we would call our millennial audience and those younger users. Um, so we're definitely thinking about that. How can the library get feedback from pinners? That's a great question. Um, there are a couple of different ways for you to interact with pinners. Again, it's not really a place where um, it's one of the reasons, another reason why I really like Pinterest is it's a very positive place if you ever look at the comments as opposed to um, other folks, you know, other places where people might register an opinion. Generally, the comments on a pin are about the actual pin and not one another um, is to read those comments. Um, there's also likes. There's a little heart button that you can press. Um, but again, the most valuable thing that you're going to want to pay attention to are your analytics. So by setting up that account and getting your analytics, you'll know what your top pins were in the last 30 days. You'll know what's being repinned the most by what audience. Um, and so I think really looking at that data is what we hear is the most valuable to improve your engagement moving forward. Okay, I'm, I'm a K-8. Um, school librarian, and we've been doing a remodel in our library this year. So that sounds I started fun. a Pinterest board, and I put things from my kids that uh, posted tips from my kids, images, oh, that's as cool. well as finding my own, which was fine until you started requiring a login, and now they can't see the board. I, I think I'm sensing a theme, so I know, <laughs> I know what I'm taking back to my executives, and I, I, I hear you. I promise you, it's, it's, not, it's not something that we don't debate on a regular basis. <laughs> Can you show us how you post an event, like for your calendar, for things going on? Oh, do, do, would you mind demoing that? For, for an event, let's see. I don't usually do the event. Oh, so how we would use this in an event setting? Oh, okay, so what we would do is, um, so for example, let's go to our calendar. Here's our events. So let's say for example, we all want to learn about black holes, space warps, and, and time machines, obviously. Because, you know, that's right. So you can, um, this um, computer doesn't have, there's like a little a pin icon uh, that you have up here. You just download it to your, to your um, bar. Um, you click on that and all the images on the page will pop up. You click the image that you want to advertise I mean, this is kind of fun, but that guy was so dashing that um, we might want to pick him. It depends who, who you got, you know? So you um, pick the image that you want, and it will automatically transport you through space and time back to exactly your page. So whatever, I mean, I, I, I can't really do it right now because we don't have a Pinterest, a Pinterest button. No, you can cut and paste and, and link yeah. it and put it in. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say something a little maybe controversial, though, which is I love the thinking about events. But again, as somebody, I spend a lot of time looking at top pins every day because I work with the media that wants to know what was the top pin dress from the Met Gala, what's the top pin <laughs> pinned book. Um, is the things that are most popular on Pinterest are evergreen. So if it's an annual event or it's something that you're doing year over year that you'd like to draw attention to, I think Pinterest is a great place. If it's something that's a one-time um, and you really want to broadcast that to your community, I'd use something like Facebook or Twitter because that's better for real-time information. This is more of a collection and curation of ideas. So this would be where you get the little browser button that would just go sit right up here and let you pin any images. And then it gives, you a, the, it gives you a choice of which image you want. I'm having a real moment trying to find the widget one. It's amazing how difficult it is mm -hmm. to find something you use all the time when you're on a stage and people are watching you. Yes. <laughs> I'm just putting that out there. I'm actually incredibly clever, but this is right now. Yeah, so you just you say get our browser button. But for the widget to make that. Oh, oh, widget. oh, yeah. yeah. OK. Um, so you want to scroll down here for tools. 
Um, oh, you know why? Because you're at about.pinterest instead of business.pinterest. Okay. okay, I'll get there. Hi. Um, I'm hearing a lot of language that I normally associate with, I guess, the natural world. Um, you said things like ecosystem, organic pins, cross-pollinate. So can you talk a little bit about where that language and terminology comes I, from? I love that comment. Um, I'm using language that we really use company-wide. Um, I've never gotten that question, but I'm wondering if it does go back. We um, were founded by two scientists. Ben was a pre-med student. Um, I mentioned he loved collecting bugs in his bedroom. Um, and I think he really thinks about information as a science um, and information on the web as a science. How do you collect it? How do you archive it? How do you share it? How do you make it available to everybody no matter where they are? So I think we do really think of ourselves um, as a scientific company. But if I had to categorize us, I would put us probably someplace between Apple and Google. Um, which is the balance that I love so much of art and science. It's a good place to be. Someday, I should say. <laughs> Maybe not from an earnings potential yet, but from, from an iconic perspective, that's where we'd love to be. Um, because we look at a lot of data to inform things, but given the rich um, you know, architectural history of our designers, we have a, a extremely world-class creative team, um, we think a lot about what is also the aesthetic and artistic um, product that we want to have, so we spend a lot of time balancing data with what we think is the best experience for pinners. Great observation. Uh, do you have any version of a library at Pinterest headquarters? We have, um, we do. We have a book borrowing room. Um, so either books that folks are sending us um, from our brands or that they'd like us to promote on Pinterest or something that somebody really loves, um, we put it um, on a shelf and, and, and share books that way. A lot of readers. Um, I actually was just texting with a colleague, a woman, um, I'll embarrass her now and share her name, Jamie Favaza, um, and she is uh, 25 years old and right now she is out at a networking event that she's taking my place for. Um, and I said, well, do you want to switch? And she, she said, absolutely. If I could talk about books all day long, I'd be a happy girl. <laughs> um, and pretty much everything that we do relates back to some kind of Harry Potter or Hobbit reference for her. <laughs> so I will, there were a lot of, there were a lot of um, reading lovers at Pinterest. So let's, this is the widget builder. I know someone asked about that. When you click here, it will say, uh, find which, let's say, so add if a you Pinterest want pin, pin widget. I usually go build it. Yeah. Come on, it's buddy. It's not right. It's not. It's taking a second to load, but it will literally give you the code that you can use. So I'll send this many you. times to a blogger too, and just show them that the. Um, um, the code that they can use. One of the reasons why, in addition to making it look beautiful, um, one of the reasons why a widget is helpful is it sort of sends traffic on the web in a circle. So um, people reading about that Pinterest board on a website, let's say, can click through and come to Pinterest, provided they have an account and they can log in. Um, and then for folks on Pinterest that may not know about the additional services or your website, it's drawing traffic back. So you're, you're now sending folks in a circle, which as you can imagine, online publishers are a big fan of. You know what I think it is? Um, I'm not, yeah, I could do that. I've, I've never done it in IE, I have to be honest. I've only done it in Chrome. Me neither. I have, I'm a Chromer. I'm a Chromer. But obviously it works since I did it on our webpage. So trust me. Well, you, you may and not you're have right. You can always you can always cut and paste as well. You can cut and paste the link, throw mm -hmm. it right in, and it will pull up the images. I just love the tab because it's really easy to just really click. You know, while you're browsing for article pins, um, which is one of the rich pins we have. I love to do that. So I'm on the web reading a bunch of different articles. I want to save it for later. I hit the tab. Oh, because we're not logged in as business. That's why. Hello. Yep. Another question. Okay, then I will. We've all got limited resources as librarians. Mm-hmm. One of the things I'm having a hard time getting my head around is evergreen content on Pinterest compared with the need for fresh content on our web page. Where do we put our limited resources? 
Oh, I thought you were going to say ever, uh, real-time content on social networks, because we get that question a lot. Like, can I just put on what I'm putting on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all those other places? Well, that's a follow-up. Um, and, and the answer to that one is probably not. You really want to do something that's unique, that is a hack, that is helpful, that is a list, that is evergreen, because that's the content that does well. Um, but to your former question of where do you put the resources um, between the web and Pinterest, I actually think, um, you know, we hear from a lot of publishers, the home page has to be fresh content. But there's lots of goodies behind there that you've probably worked on previously that is um, material that is not being actively refreshed on your web page. And I would think about some of those archives as things that you want to put on Pinterest. Another question. Yes. Here, reach back. Right. Oh, I had two questions. You know, a lot of libraries have original content like photographic archives mm -hmm. and things like that. And I was wondering what your opinion is in terms of um, is that something good to put on Pinterest? Photography then, is incredibly um, both popular and powerful. Um, on Pinterest, especially iconic photography. I can share that um, I think my board that is the most popular and that has been repinned the most are um, iconic photography of celebrities. Um, so I, I do think that's something that would do really well, but I do think you really want to include as much as you can in that pin description like we talked about so that people understand that that, um, is that art that is from your community or? Um, we, we have a photographic archive of like World War II oh, kind of material. Cool. And um, I think we have some other local collections, you know, so a lot of libraries have these local collections mm -hmm. that um, I think, yeah, if we had more descriptive information, it might be helpful for people who are just looking for information on that topic. On that topic, and, and then it know. comes up and they don't realize that, you know, the library might be a great place to have an archive of that information. Yeah, I think that's something that would do really well. Someone we didn't talk about today is National Geographic. They're hugely popular um, on Pinterest, and they do a lot with their archive. Um, yeah, I, I would love to see you do that. OK. And then my second question was more kind of a user experience type thing. Is mm -hmm. there any way to turn off the recommended pins? Because in, when, you're, when you're pinning something, you know, then that screen comes up, and you have to click through that screen to get back to where you are browsing. And yes. I could see from my own personal experience or from someone managing a business page, you know, that might get annoying for people or you might just want them to stay focused on what your boards are. Another hot topic at Pinterest. So she's referring to pins picked for you, which there are opinions about all over the board. So yesterday I got a note that said, thank you so much for pins picked for you. You know me better than my boyfriend. <laughs> Um, that, yeah, that might be another topic. But we also hear from longtime pinners who have really spent time curating their feed and figuring out who they want to follow, and they use their home feed as a place to see all of that information. And now that there are a lot of pins picked for you, they don't necessarily see that or it interrupts the experience to your part, to your point. Um, that's a way to turn it off, right? I mean, mm -mm. no? No. No. She um, actually works there, so I'm going to go with her. Um, <laughs> We are definitely playing with the balance of pins picked for you. Um, again, in that discussion of the balance of art and science, um, what data tells us is that particularly new pinners, particularly men, particularly people who want a lightweight experience on Pinterest, really enjoy those um, because it's surfacing content that they don't have to go look for. Um, but I think we're still figuring out and you know, maybe someday allowing some people to take more advantage of it, others to take less about what that balance is. If you're working with YouTube and you have uh, hundreds or thousands of videos, then they will uh, give you a bulk uploader. So does Pinterest have? One of the most requested features. Um, we did make a bulk editing announcement at the end of last year. So anyone who doesn't know that, you can move pins very quickly from one board to another if you have thousands of pins. But upload it, an upload tool right now, no. Something I'd love to see, something I've seen in experiments, and hopefully something will get out there. I, I work on the uh, historical photo collection here at SFPL. It's been a while to what the woman back there is talking about. Oh. And I was just thinking about if we pin a bunch of photos and gave very descriptive information, people can repin it and wipe all that information and maybe misattribute it. So, do you have any like statistics or information about? what percentage of pinners 
um, yeah, like wipe descriptions and put in their own? I don't. I'm interested in that, so let me look into it and get, and get back to you. Um, I will tell you that most people do not change the pin description. Um, yeah. Um, I think that makes you a power pinner. Um, but for most, it was funny, I was you know, talking about this presentation with my husband last night, who's been using Pinterest for about a year, which is about how long I've been with the company. Um, and he said, I had no idea you could change a pin description. And most people do not. So I, I'm going to guess that most of the time, those things are not changed. Um, I would hope that that information would remain correct. Um, I think your best path there is that at least it's linking to the right source of information and getting to the right thing. Um, but yeah, I think a good question that I'd love to look into. To follow up with that, if I may. So if the description has changed, the a link to the original source, the citation as it were, the copyright credit remains. That's correct. Okay. The link and the attribution will never change from where it was pinned. Uh, do you have d um, statistics on your user demographics? I can share what we've said publicly. Um, I touched on some of them, but let me go through that. So um, in terms of user numbers, we refer people to Comscore. Um, I hope later this year um, we'll be um, releasing some ourselves. But So we say that there are more than 70 million active users. Um, about 30% of that population is outside the United States. The majority is here. Um, about a third of all users are now male. We haven't given the number of what that is, but there's some math that can be done there. Um, what else do we say? Um, excuse me, and I should correct myself. It's a third of all new signups are men. So that's what makes it one of the fastest growing demographics. Um, and I think, I think that's all we've really said publicly at this point. I think as we grow more rapidly, you'll hear more from us. Is there something specific you're interested in? Ah, uh, um, we do not, but when you have a business account and we talk and you get those analytics, you can see the ages of um, folks that are pinning. So you can see the ages of the people that are interacting with your own content. Was there another question? Yes. New users. And is it possible to have a, not turn them off entirely, but somewhere you can check, I've been here, I've done that, I don't need the new recommendations, hold them back? I think it's a good suggestion. Um, I feel like many folks have said something very similar to that, maybe even myself in a meeting or two. So I think, again, as we, I can tell you, I, you know, I've worked um, at Apple, I was um, a consultant of Facebook, and I will definitely tell you that the pinner experience and what pinners want um, is the guiding principle at Pinterest. So I, I think there will be more choice um, and more option as our product develops. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, so I work here at San Francisco Public Library, and we do have a historical photo Pinterest board, and I highly recommend using that because it is our more popular board. Um, so, and I've also seen folks pin from our historical photograph collection, so that's a great one. And people love it when you repin that because then it, they're just so happy. And I did notice, um, and it's a lot of men that like the historical mm -hmm. photos. So I was good, yeah, thank you for mentioning that. So yeah, if you want to up are really high performing male Edward, interaction, huh? that's a great one. And then, um, but I missed your talk, so I was just wondering, so sorry about that, no, that's okay. <laughs> You're here now. But I was multitasking. Um, I was wondering if you had a suggestion of a limit on how many pins a board should have. Ah. Because uh, I've, I feel like I may have expanded our photo one a little too much, so I was wondering if like, if just, yeah, yeah, if there's a limit. Much more of the guidelines that we give is about um, the minimum amount of content that you want to put on there. So I wouldn't worry so much about maximum content. I might suggest you use some of our editing tools to both move those boards around and move the pins on the board so that you're putting um, maybe some of the newer and fresher stuff up top. Um, but I can tell you from a minimum guideline perspective, if anybody's interested with that, you know, whether I'm working with um, a notable name who's coming to Pinterest or a media organization, we usually recommend between 30 and 40 pins per board. And 
and that you don't launch a profile um, with a least, you want to launch it with at least 15 to 20 boards. Um, that is for two reasons. One, if somebody discovers you, you want to give them sort of a robust sense um, of the services that you're providing, but also the more that you put out on Pinterest that can be searched and discovered in those five ways that we talked about, the more that I call it, the, you know, the life of, um, of the pin, so the more places it can populate. But it sounds like you don't have that problem, so I, I would keep pinning. Okay, so we'll do one more question and then we're gonna, we're gonna wrap it up. Thank you for bringing questions. I was worried I was gonna run short. So I was just thinking, you know, in terms of events. Mm -hmm. So if you have a celebrity coming who would have a lot of content behind her or him, so would this be, even though it's a one-shot, you know, event, this would be something that people would want to know about and yeah. this would be something to go on. Yeah, maybe one of the first things that I would look at, and um, this is something the New York Times has done really well, is I might look and see if that notable name has a presence on Pinterest. Um, Another fun fact today is that actually most of the successful top pinners are people you've never heard of, which I sort of love, um, because they're experts in a particular area or they're just doing a great job at pinning. Um, but more and more, uh, as our audience grows, you will find a lot of notable names on Pinterest and they will likely have a large audience. So something you might want to do is, is collaborate with their team on a group board ask them to pin to something um, so that folks see that. I do think that's a nice way, and that was you know, sort of the example of Operation Smile. I do think that is a nice way to share audiences um, and something that are, is a highly indexed search term, our individual celebrity names. Well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, guys. Thanks, I appreciate everybody. it. Thanks for bearing with me.